Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Well, hello there and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. This is episode number 143. The discovery of DNA as well as the understanding of its function and structure may be one of the most important discoveries of the last century. As researchers continue to unlock its secrets, the applications to the scientific, medical, agricultural and forensics fields has been enormous. From enabling the breeding of animals and crops that are better resistant to disease, to being able to accurately identify criminals and victims, and even to detect disease in humans early on and create breakthrough treatments for diseases that were previously considered lethal, DNA research is having a huge effect on mankind. But what about the applications to trading? One of the topics we discuss in this podcast episode is the DNA approach to trading. So what is that? How can we understand it? And what are the benefits? To discuss this topic, plus a number of others, we're joined by Bruce Vanstone from Vanstone Trading. Bruce is a trader, consultant, and university lecturer in computational finance and big data. He's published a number of research papers and trading systems and presented material at a number of non-academic conferences. He also consults to a boutique fund management business, trades personally, and also at a larger fund management level. In our chat with Bruce today, you're going to discover the DNA approach and why you need to understand it, how to add another layer of logic over a strategy to identify the best trading conditions, why it's important to have trading strategies with academic credibility, how a simple change in time frame can increase returns and reduce drawdowns, the common trap strategy creators fall into when adjusting strategies without even realizing it, and a whole lot more. So let's head on over to my chat now with Bruce. Hi Bruce, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you on here as a guest today. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, how about we just start with a little bit of background on yourself so people can um, get to know you a little bit better. Do you want to just uh, explain how you got started in the markets? Sure, Andrew. Um, well, I suppose a bit of background. So I'm, I'm an Aussie. I live on the Gold Coast um, in Queensland. My background is really in IT. So I started um, or I finished a, an IT degree back in 1986, which Seems a really long time ago now. Uh, and uh, worked for the government in an IT sort of role for a couple of years. Uh, I got a bit tired of that and ended up going to the UK uh, and stayed there for 13 years in the end. Um, I did a lot of IT and sort of business analysis kind of consultancy, but I've always been really interested in investment. Um, and so I decided to come back to Australia uh, around about the year 2000. And I ended up back at um, back in Queensland uh, on the Gold Coast. And I went around to my local university, which is Bond University, and ended up getting a job as a lecturer there um, because of my IT background. And I was able to pursue my interest in finance, and I've always been a bit mathematical and statistical. So I ended up completing a PhD in computational finance at Bond um, with supervisors Dr. Clarence Ten and Professor Gavin Finney, who are also uh, they're pretty well known. Um, so I was quite lucky in, in a sense. I had the IT skills to be able to, um, to build systems and things of that nature. I had the sort of investment interests and in the mm. sort of uh, finance interests. And then, of course, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get enrolled in the computational finance PhD. So a lot of lucky things came together for me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So now, what about today? What are you, what are you doing now? Uh, so I'm a full-time academic at Bond University, uh, as I say, on the Gold Coast in Australia. Um, being a full-time academic is my main role. Um, I do other work. I, I run some. Um, I run private funds. I trade myself, of course, uh, and invest. And I'm also a consultant for a couple of boutique fund managers around. Uh, but at Bond, which is my main focus as being an academic, uh, I teach courses on financial trading systems to students. Um, and I'm also quite. Uh, I also teach in data science and big data. Um, so my, I suppose the best interest or the biggest interest for your listeners would be my financial trading systems work at Bond. Uh, and the idea of the course is to focus on teaching the students how to rigorously backtest something. So a lot of people seem to do backtesting, but I think the word rigorous is is missing from a lot of the people that I talk to. So yeah. I teach students about rigorous backtesting and also about academically credible investment strategies. Um, so we're not really sort of interested in in um, 
you know, anomalies or well, anomalies is not the right or wrong word, sorry, but um, you know, pie in the sky kind of ideas. We focus on things that are academically proven. There's a lot of credibility around. And then we think about how to test those properly, how to code them up and how to capture their returns. So I'm talking about areas like momentum specifically, uh, statistical arbitrage, to some extent, channel band trading, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of evidence out there that those kind of things, you know, have some real legs. Yep. Okay. Well, let's uh, just dig into momentum uh, for a little bit. What was the actual appeal to momentum? Like, what what actually drew you to that particular style? Uh, I suppose I'd been trading uh, before that quite a bit. I did a bit of um, band trading um, and channel breakout kind of stuff. Mm. I didn't really like the idea that you had to be. Uh, so I was trading end of day, which sort of meant you had to put in your orders at the end of the day. Then you go to work the next morning, and you sort of sometime during the day you'd see what had happened and and uh, try and monitor your positions and things. So I was looking for something that was a little bit longer term and a little bit um, a little bit more hands off in terms of the day to day management. Um, so I didn't want to necessarily be at the computer every single day, or at least trading every single day at the computer. Um, and I also wanted a bit of flexibility. At the time, I had two very young children. When I first came back to Australia, my youngest one was one and a half. So, um, and I was a home dad, so I spent a year looking after her. So it wasn't really a position where I could just sort of be sitting in front of a computer all the time. And I wanted the opportunity to design a system where I could, you know, if I was a couple of days late putting in the orders, it just didn't matter. Or if I missed a, a stop, um, it wasn't a big deal. Um, so I was looking at different kinds of things which had academic credibility, which seemed like that they, you know, they had real legs, but they didn't uh, rely on split second timing or huge amounts of money and, and all that sort of stuff. And momentum was about the only thing that really stood out. Hmm. So what type of uh, academic credibility did you find about momentum that really kind of pushed you that way? Was there any particular uh, papers or uh, research things that kind of pushed you there? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Andrew. Actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence out there um, in academic world about uh, about momentum. So just as a quick summary, um, momentum's been demonstrated uh, in equities markets, um, both US and foreign markets. It's been demonstrated in commodity markets, real estate markets, FX markets, government corporate bonds, countries, styles, industries. I mean, it just spans the range. There's, there's basically no area where there isn't uh, some work on momentum. And I've done a fair bit of work on momentum in Australia as well and have some uh, publications out there in that area. Um, so I was quite impressed. And, and one of the things that really hooked me, I suppose, was I found a paper, uh, I think, uh, by an academic called Griffin, where he tested momentum in 40 different countries. Uh, and documented strong momentum persistence in every single one of them. And then I started doing more and more investigation. And like I say, found out about the commodities, the real estate, the FX, the indices. It was just it was just everywhere. Uh, and I suddenly realized, okay, this is something I've got to spend some serious time on because pretty much all the different academic work I was looking at was reviewing things that, that sort of met my conditions. You didn't need huge amounts of money. It didn't rely on split-second timing. And in fact, the majority of them are monthly. The majority of the papers out there are around about um, setting your portfolio for the month and then uh, resetting it again the next month, and often no intervention at all uh, in the intervening month. Mm -hmm. Now, as um, you know, you can of course uh, always do extra rigorous testing, etc., which I did. But even at the at the sort of monthly level, I found out there, there seemed to be a, a, an awful amount of abnormal returns sitting there, um, even in the Australian market. So I suppose um, it sort of met the conditions I had. It allowed me to um, to work from home to some extent. It also allowed me to um, to spend the time I wanted with my small children uh, and still be involved in the markets and still do the kind of research I was interested in. Yeah. I think that's an important consideration to make, actually, is to find a particular trading style that suits your lifestyle. I think it definitely makes it easier to follow when it fits in with you. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so I think um, one of the challenges with momentum, though, is that it doesn't always persist. It does end. So what have you found uh, some ways to cope with that, the, uh, the shifts in momentum? Um, I suppose I think about it a little bit differently to that. So, so um, one of the interesting things that I see when I, when I read articles about momentum is that there's really two different types. And, um, and different people seem to be talking about different types at different times. For example, if I talk to, um, to traders who are nearly starting out with some sort of um, backtesting software, they know there's a technical analysis indicator called momentum. And so they think we're talking about that. Th that's a real thing too. There's nothing wrong with that. But really, there's two forms of momentum. There's the cross-sectional anomaly. And that's the idea like, um, so for example, you would get a universe like the ASX 200. And you might sort stocks based on their historical return. 
and you might buy the stocks which have gone up the most historically and short out the ones which have gone down the most historically and form portfolios that way. And that's the kind of cross-sectional anomaly. Um, or there's the, uh, the time series anomaly. And that's what Gary Antonacci on uh, Podcast 9 refers to as being uh, absolute momentum. So that's got its own academic name called time series momentum, and that's probably a lot closer to the indicator that most people are thinking of when they think of momentum. So that's where you would have an individual instrument and you drop an indicator on it like momentum, and it effectively gives you the rolling rate of change over some predetermined piece of time. Yep. Um, so that rolling rate of change over some predetermined piece of time like that time series momentum, it, again, there's a huge amount of evidence specifically around uh, the persistence of that, and there's a lot of work demonstrating that in futures, in FX markets, and again in stocks. Um, and I'm particularly focused on the cross-sectional momentum, so I form portfolios of groups of stocks. Um, and I suppose, referring back to Gary Antonacci again in, in Podcast 9 that's on your site, um, Gary Antonacci talks about dual momentum where he effectively combines the two things together. So I think there's a lot of credibility to that as well. So it kind of seems like no matter which way you look at it and which form of momentum you're talking about, there's a huge amount of historical research out there um, which seems to show that it's got real legs. Hmm. Yeah, you you suggested uh, just a, a few moments ago that there was a, a lot of uh, return to be picked up at the monthly kind of time frame level. Do you think that there is more of an edge at those longer time frames than the shorter time frames? Absolutely. Um, I, I also do a bit of coaching um, for traders. And one of the interesting things I see is it's uh, probably the most common form of trading, I would say, of people that I uh, end up talking to is some sort of trend-based trading. Um, so, for example, they might be buying trend crossovers with, I don't know, involving some other indicators like RSI or something like that. But at the end of the day, they're trying to uh, buy the market behavior of things that are going up longer term. Um, and one of the interesting things that you, you nearly always see with backtesting software, and I'd encourage your readers to do it if you're trading this way, is to, um, is to run your system in daily mode. So you might be buying a 20-day crossover of a 50-day moving average or something like that. Um, simply change your frequency to weekly and run it again, and almost without doubt, you'll see a relevant increase in returns and a reduction in uh, in drawdown just by changing to a different time frame. So there really is a lot of um, legs to looking at the longer-term time frames, and uh, it, a longer-term time frame smooths away a lot of the uncertainty and makes things a, and makes a lot of the noise kind of disappear to some extent. So momentum kind of pushes that, I suppose, to a slightly uh, longer monthly kind of time frame. But that's well worth doing if you're uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you're trading an end of day tr trend trading style strategy. Simply leave your rules exactly the same way they are. Run it over exactly the same stocks, but just change your frequency to weekly. And I'd uh, be pretty surprised if you didn't see your returns jack up and your drawdown kind of drop away. Mm, yeah. Okay. So I just want to uh, dig in a little bit deeper about um, you've made a number of statements now about. Uh, perhaps the challenges or mistakes that uh, system traders make. I realise that you uh, you teach system trading at, at uni and you also uh, run some private courses as well where you teach traders. So what kind of challenges or um, mistakes do you see system traders commonly make? Oh, thanks, Andrew. That's, that is a great question. Look, one of the things I, I see is that, um, and, and maybe before I answer that, maybe from a different angle, um, I think there's something a little bit wrong with our profession, and, and that's if you call trading a profession. I, I, I guess people want to argue about that a lot too, and maybe I'd be one of them. But but if we think of it in general sort of terms, um, I see, whenever I look on websites, I see things like people talking about a high failure rate amongst traders, and, and I even see numbers quoted around about near 90% of traders wash out in the first year. Look, I don't know if those are the real numbers or not, but I don't think most people set out to throw their money away, and most people go out there and buy these uh, trading books and they read the book and and maybe there's a bit of misinterpretation but I don't see how we get failure rates of about 90% when when people are actively reading books and trying to follow rules and to me that says there's something wrong with you know some of that information that's out there um, so so I suppose why I'm more focused on the kind of approach that I use is because I think traders are are looking at rules they're trying to follow them sensibly they're back testing them but they're just not doing it right so a good example if if I could jump in with a really good example, it's cool. that um, I talked to some trend traders actually not too long ago, uh, and they wanted to test their trend trading strategy. And what they did is they looked at all the stocks that were in the ASX 200 at the moment, and they got the 10 years history of each every single one of those stocks, and then they ran their system over that. And that's got a huge academic bias called this survivorship bias is the name for that. And I'm sure your uh, listeners would be aware of the fact that, of course, um, you know, if you don't account for things like delistings and uh, mergers and acquisitions and, and changes on a monthly uh, basis and constituents and things like that, that the universe that you're running in is, is very inflated. 
Um, so the ASX 200, for example, is a market cap weighted index. So companies who do really poorly will eventually get chucked out of the index. And, and naturally, if you get 10 years worth of history of everything that's in there right now, it looks pretty good. Um, so there's nothing wrong with with the rules that they're using necessarily, but what they've done is they've just haven't back tested properly because they didn't realise that there are all these little biases around, and there are lots of biases like this that will just come and bite you, and you could be following the rules correctly, you think you're testing everything right, but you've just made some simple little mistake, and of course going forward, or historically in your back test, your returns will look really strong, but going forward, of course, they're not going to look like that. Another really simple example that I see people do is. Uh, I see in books things like you know buying stocks when they're – don't buy stocks if they were less than $10 or $5 or something like that. But, of course, whenever you get historical data, it's been back adjusted for splits. And um, So you might get some uh, some data now that shows back in 2005 the price of the stock was $5. But at the time, it probably wasn't $5. There's been a number of splits since then. And every time there's a split, for example, a two-for-one share split, they historically halve all the prices. So you buy a strategy that says, well, I'll buy all stocks under $5. But most of the ones you're buying in your historical back test were never under $5. They are now, 10 years later, when the price has been back adjusted. So again, it's not necessarily that you're using the tool wrongly. It's you've got to understand all these kind of characteristics to be able to make sure that what you're doing is actually going to stand up going forward. So, so that's an example of, of pe- people maybe not back testing things correctly. And there are plenty of other mistakes uh, like that that people make. And I suppose the other thing I'm focused on is trying to bring a bit of data science and a bit of a bit of statistics to uh, – to trading, and again, it's not for everybody. Um, but a, a common example uh, is traders will set up their system, and they'll be using it for a while, and they'll have some ideas about how they should change their rules. And they'll change the rules, and they'll run the system again historically, and they'll say, "Oh, look, it looks like it's better." But I suppose the real question is: Is it statistically better? Are you just making it more complex, but you're not statistically improving the result? And there are all sorts of statistics to be able to do this kind of work. Um, but like most people, I suppose when they hear statistics, they immediately run away. Um, and, and that's understandable to some extent, but um, but I think there's a you know there's a lot of potential there. So so I try and coach people around that kind of uh, that kind of thinking. And of course, at university, the students learn um, they learn that way. So when I talk about rigorous back testing and academically credible investment strategies, those are the kind of things that we spend a lot of time focused on. Mm, yeah, I think you raise a really good point there um, for traders who are testing strategies is uh, they may adjust some filters or, you know, stop level or something like that and run a back test and that looks great, but they don't really consider, um, you know, how, how much change did this rule actually make it? Did it only adjust a, a couple of trades? Did it cut out one big trade? I don't think there's a, um, a real conscious uh, consideration of that type of thing. So what can traders do to rein that in and look at it more from a, a statistical significance viewpoint? Uh, a great question, Andrew. Um, I th- look, I think one of the things is just to be uh, – there are specific statistics. I'm happy to, to talk about those. But I think a, a bigger thing is for people just to be aware of the fact that they need to do it. So, for example, one thing that has come up and uh, in some discussions I have with traders is that they they just don't think that they even should be doing that. It's like they ran the system and had a back test result of, let's say, 15% a year. And then they made some changes to it, and suddenly it's gone to 16% a year. So those changes were great. And then I made some more changes, and look, at 17, and I did it again, and I got to 18, and finally I'm on 20%, and I've got 10 different rules in there. I'm good to go. And suddenly you've just increased the complexity to such an extent that the wheels are probably about to fall off. Um, so there are statistical processes to use, but I think the bigger thing is that is that people aren't really necessarily aware that they should even be doing that. So, for example, every time you add in a new set of rules or add in a new filter condition or something like that, or a stop or a money management rule, you're adding a level of complexity. And like everything in the markets, uh, you know, the more complex it gets, the less likely it is to survive. I mean, simple works. It's, it's. I think uh, anyone who's successful in, in investments would be pretty aware that the simple stuff is what really uh, delivers. Yep. Complexity is fine if it's working for you, but I, I think um, for most people, just trying to make things more and more complicated – uh, to try and get a bigger and bigger number and a smoother and smoother looking equity curve tends to be um, quite self-defeating in the, in the long term. Mm, yeah. Well, do you want to rattle off some um, some names of some t- uh, statistical measures that we can use to kind of look at that? Because I I can imagine people listening to this right now are going, okay, well, what you know, what can I do to to look at this further? So where should people um, start? Oh, great. Um, yeah. So. Um, one of the things I'd kind of encourage my students to do, for example, when they're trying to understand a little bit about how their strategy works. So before we get to that question, just to understand the strategy is to think a little bit more along the statistical lines of autocorrelation. So we focus on, for example, positive and negative serial autocorrelation a lot to understand the characteristics of how systems work. 
uh, once we're making back tests of things and you've got a, a set of trades, for example, from a, from a system and a set of trades from the same system with a couple of adjustments to it, um, there are ways to compare those sets of trades and we could compare all sorts of things. We could compare the dollar profit per trade. We could compare the drawdown on an individual trade. We could compare the length of time that trades are held open. And there's a set of statistics around that, like the ANOVA statistic, for example, or even just as paired sample t-tests. It's a bit naive, but it's certainly doable. Um, there are ways to compare sharp ratios like L the Leduart wolf test or the Diebol mariano to directly compare things like um, two sharp ratios from different systems. There's a huge number of different choices, and there's a lot of statistical stuff out there. I guess the bigger thing for most people is just to start thinking that, well, okay, how is this going to add value? Uh, once you know what you want to do, I mean, Google's the ultimate source of um, a million different articles about anything that you're after. But I think the bigger thing is that to get people starting to think, well, if I make changes, I need to statistically verify that these changes have done something. Once people get to that point, finding the, the right statistic is, you know, is reasonably straightforward. But for most people, I don't think they even get to the point of saying, well, I've added a new rule. I better check statistically that it's actually doing something. They just run the back test and say, oh, look, my profit increased by 1%. This rule's a killer. And, and they're good to go again. And we get these sort of systems that are, well, I, I guess words like curve fit are starting to come into mind. But, um, you know, systems which are getting more and more complex and probably, you know, less and less predictable. And then some, something occurs in the markets the system hasn't used to and, you know, it, it's, uh, its legs fall off. Yep. Yep. I saw in um, one of your presentations, I think it was for the ATAA a few years back, you were talking about strategy creation and, and you suggested something called a DNA approach. Uh, can you explain a little bit about um, what you mean by that? Yes, yeah, so the DNA approach, I, I'm not sure it's a, um, it's a terminology you'll find a lot out there talking about trading and investment. It's just something I sort of made up a little bit in talking with my students. But what I'm really getting at there is is what some people might call market behavior. But I'm thinking about it a little bit more statistically and, and econometrically, uh, particularly in terms of things like um, – uh, like autocorrelation. So, for example, we know uh, from work like momentum or trading, and we, are, I mean, uh, academics and traders and investors, uh, if we're thinking about something like momentum, we know that there's a, a historical momentum anomaly, which basically says if a stock's been going up in the past for a sustained period of time, it's more likely to continue to do so in the future, at least roughly along words along those kind of lines. And people might debate a lot about the exact terminology, but that's effectively what the the momentum anomaly is trying to get at. Um, so by DNA, I'm kind of thinking about that as that market behavior. If we're trying to trend trade for the longer term, the, the market behavior is that you would be rewarded to some extent if you were to buy those stocks and continue to hold them. So for example, we know if we think about momentum, stocks have been going up in the past, are a little bit more likely to continue to do so, and buy corollary stocks that have been going down in the past are likely to continue to do so. So Consistent with the idea of the DNA or market behavior, it wouldn't make sense to try and bottom fish. So, for example, if you heard a trader saying, well, I buy stocks that have been going down for the last year because they're bound to turn around and go up the other way. Well, that's what we call bottom fishing, right? But yeah. with a little bit of scientific understanding, uh, we know that that's not really going to work out in the long term. It doesn't mean you can't get a couple of really good, lucky, successful trades and make a bit of money. But if your methodology relies on you consistently doing that, then we know if stocks have been going up in historically in the longer term, they're likely to continue. And if they've been going down historically in the longer term, they're likely to continue. So the idea of bottom fishing something that's been going down and hoping it's going to turn around and run the other way is probably a little bit self-defeating. So my DNA concept is just an idea of I use for students to try and say, well, what's the DNA of the of the, of the the approach that you're trying to use? If, if you're trying to buy something in a medium term or longer term kind of environment, then we know about positive serial autocorrelation and its relationship with momentum. And so make choices and decisions in your trading strategies that are consistent with the longer term expectations of that approach. Yep. So that's, that's the kind of thinking I try and use to do it. Yeah. I like that kind of approach as well, because it kind of gives you a little bit of a, an understanding of when a strategy starts to fall apart. Sorry, even uh, before that, when the, when the market char characteristics change and a strategy starts falling apart, it kind of gives you an idea of what's what's going on and uh, can can probably help with your expectation as well. It does a little bit, I think, and, and also in those sort of times, like trading's easy when the markets are going up, right? We're all making money, but in those times when you're under a bit of stress and the market isn't doing what you expect and you're losing a little bit of money and and you're waking up and feeling stressed. This is when you sort of sit back and you say, okay, it's not time to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I've tested this thing properly. Lots of other people have. There's plenty of empirical and academic evidence that seems to support it. I'll just keep marching forward. 
Um, you know, and I and I think there's a lot to that because we're not really tested as traders till the market's really against us. But when it's against us, that's when you kind of you know you question yourself and wonder if you've done everything right and whether you're sort of you know kidding yourself. And when there's suddenly a lot of you know you lean back and say, okay, well a lot of other people have tested this. It's academically credible. It looks like it's worked in the longer term. Um, you learn a little bit about being patient and and um, you know and sticking with it. And I think that's the big thing as well for many traders who haven't sort of got that idea that their strategy has some academically credible kind of legs behind it when the market moves a little bit against you you suddenly sudden, suddenly stop trading or you close your positions or you think it's time to redevelop your strategy i often wonder how many babies have been thrown out with the bathwater you know in that sort of sense how many people have had a good strategy and the market's had a bit of a run against them and and you know everything would have turned around and worked out nicely for the longer term but they threw it out or made changes that that um, you know probably unhinged the thing a little bit going forward so I think, you know, in many ways as a trader, you just need support. Um, and, and this kind of support, I suppose, comes from knowing that you've tested things properly. You, you're relying on an approach which other people have found to be able to be successful. Um, and, and of course, then you stick with it. Yeah, I've noticed in my own uh, strategy testing that when I'm looking at the annual returns, I've had a you know a pretty poor year or a flat year, and then it's uh, then it's taken off again, you know, afterwards. So I think um, w- what you mentioned there about the character of the market and uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater is <laughs> is very valid because I've seen that a lot of times where if I decided to turn a strategy off because it had a bit of a flat year, then I would have missed out on you know future profits by doing that. Absolutely, I, I think that's really important and. And the other thing is, um, you know, I'll often talk with traders who will have come to me with a back test and will say, this is what my back test looks like. And they'll show me like a 15 years worth of back test or something, and it'll show some great uh, annualized return. But maybe along the way, it had a 30 or a 40 percent drawdown. It's like, well, really, would you have stuck with this system if you'd put in $100,000 and, you'd, and, you know, six months later, it was down $40,000? Would you have got to the point of saying, hang on a minute, this isn't a good thing? In hindsight, had you stuck with it for another 15 years, it probably would have worked out. So I think you need to also put your own personal constraints into backtesting, and that's another sort of thing I think a lot of people don't do when they backtest. They just run it and look at the results and think, oh, yeah, that's doable. But could you really actually live through that backtest on a day-to-day basis without the certainty that it actually works out going forward? And, and again, if you haven't got that going for you with that uh, you know, academic credibility of you know, other people have tested this kind of strategy like momentum, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, on those dark days when the market's against you, that's when you throw that baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Yeah. So just a, a little bit more on this character of the market then. You mentioned looking at uh, autocorrelation. Is there any, anything else that you use to assess the character of a market? I think the autocorrelation stuff's a really good starting point for um, for most people. It's very approachable. Um, we're all very familiar with the idea of correlation, you know, something uh, X and Y are correlated, you know, if they move in the same direction, so, so X goes up and it has an influence on Y going up and that kind of idea. And autocorrelation is really just the same kind of idea, but the, the X and the Y are really the same instrument. So, for example, we might look at something in monthly time frame and we look at that might be the X variable, the Y variable would be the same thing in monthly time frame. So it's exactly the same thing, but we just shift it back and forth in time. So the idea of autocorrelation is that you're comparing the correlations of an instrument with itself, but it, but itself shifted to a different point historically in time. Um, and, and I think that's that sort of idea of knowing how instruments react and how markets reward those reactions is actually quite important. So, for example, in general, stylized facts is what they're called in academia and in, in finance. The general sort of stylized facts tend to be that in a longer term, we get that positive autocorrelation that, that leads to things like momentum. There's a very long-term version of that called mean reversion, which is in multi-year time frames that the prices revert back to the mean. And there's a shorter-term variation called negative autocorrelation, which means in the very short time frames, uh, daily, weekly, that kind of stuff, um, maybe as much as, as long as a week, but certainly daily and intraday, you get neg- negative autocorrelation, which is that sharp movements upwards are normally followed by uh, sharp movements downwards again. Um, so that's that negative character. One goes up and the other one goes down. And the uh, and, um, momentum sort of character is that a little bit of forward movement is continued with a little bit more forward movement. And, and so just having that idea of how markets react and how they react in different time frames, I think, is really, really important as well. Mm. Yep. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Now, I just want to ask you about um, something that I read in your book because um, I, I read your book uh, leading up into our, our chat, and I thought it was quite fascinating, actually. Now, 
I, um, I realize you don't use this uh, too much anymore, as you mentioned to me before we started this chat, but I'd just like to ask you about neural networks a little bit, because I thought the, the approach you mentioned in your book um, was quite interesting, and I can see how it can address some of the challenges we have as systematic traders. So um, firstly, maybe do you want to explain at a high level the approach that you mentioned in the book and how to use neural networks and the kind of the challenges that, that it can address? Yes. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yep. Um, so as well as being interested in investment or teaching uh, the financial trading systems course at Bond University, I also teach in a big data area, uh, areas like data science and machine learning, etc. cetera. Um, and the idea behind those kind of models is that um, th there are other sources of information, if you like, that could be useful in a trading sense. So something that's that's very recent in, uh, in that people are particularly interested out there in hedge fund world at the moment is sentiment trading. So, for example, trying to look at Twitter sentiment or news, newspaper article sentiment and things like that uh, and try and infer future price changes based on the sentiment of the crowd or the sentiment from the newspaper, that kind of thing. Um, so that idea of trying to take in these exogenous or external variables that, that you get associated um, is, is very important. Um, and the idea, of course, is how do you take it into account? So you've suddenly got some new source of information or some potential new source of information that you think might be important. How do you model that and how do you take it into account? And machine learning, um, and in my PhD, was more focused on neural networks in particular, but they're just a, a particular variation of machine learning or a particular technique. Um, the idea is that you can sort of build models using machine learning, which can take additional information into account in a black box kind of style um, and try and find ways, for example, to use that information. So a good idea might be, or a good idea, an, an example might be to try and predict tomorrow's return or the next day's return based on all the information you already have available at the moment and then some new information like sentiment for example so to some extent how much of a prediction can i make about tomorrow's prices based on some new period piece of information and the way i used to use them and, and i've uh, i don't use them so much anymore to be honest I, I still do a lot of research in this area but i don't use them in my own trading anymore um but the approach that i used to use and is still quite viable um it's more about uh, finding the set of rules that are empirically sensible, academically credible, and you're prepared to trade with, and then trying to bring in exogenous or extra forms of external information and use a neural network to use that information to try and refine the set of trades you would take. So, for example, if you were going to trend trade and buy all stocks when the 50-day moving average moved above the 200-day moving average, as an example, um, if you were prepared to trade that way and, and you believe that was a sensible approach – um, you could say, well, imagine all the possible trades that would happen if I use that set of rules and then use a neural network to try and pick from amongst those set of trades if it can pick the best trades. So the idea is that uh, even if the neural network wasn't adding any value, you'd still be taking trades that you were prepared to take anyway. And to the extent that it could add some value, it may well in improve your results. So that's the kind of approach. I don't tend to use it so much anymore myself. I don't trade that way uh, myself because I mainly just work in, uh, in momentum trading now, which is kind of, as I mentioned, around the sort of monthly time frame. So I don't really generate enough trades, um, you know, to be able to cherry pick from amongst them. But I certainly used to use that kind of approach when I was um, breakout trading and channel trading. There's certainly, um, you know, in environments where there's a lot more opportunities than there is capital available, it's, a, you know, it's still a sensible approach. Uh, but the, I like the momentum model, as I talked about before, because um, it effectively rides on that cross-sectional ranking. So you already know how many trades you're going to have and when you're going to have them. So it doesn't put you in a position where you have to cherry pick from amongst a group. It just says this is the group and then you pre-allocate the, the funds to them. So really, it's a uh, it, the benefit of using a machine learning on neural networks like that is um, as opposed to traditional ways, I guess, of building strategies is that it can look at uh, complex relationships and figure out things like that that maybe we, we wouldn't see by doing it manually. Is that the, the whole reason behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the idea is that um, in the market, the, these could well represent nonlinear relationships. And nonlinear relationships are things that, as humans, that they're not so easily understood. It's not the cases as one thing increases, the other increases, or something of that nature. It's more like under certain conditions, certain things happen. Under different conditions, something completely different may happen. Um, and a neural network is actually quite useful for ferreting out those nonlinear relationships. The disadvantage of them is they're a black box, and extracting the actual rules back from them is actually quite hard, although there's been a lot of academic progress in that over the recent years. 
Uh, but still getting rules out of a black box neural network is pretty difficult. Um, but then you can go back to those other statistical techniques I talked about before. Uh, so, for example, a system, uh, a set of trades from a system compared to a set of trades from the same system with a neural network on it. And then we can use those same statistics we talked about before to see whether the, as a set of trades, they're actually better trades than the, than the ones without the neural network, that kind of approach. But the idea is that they're capable of learning these nonlinear relationships. Um, so, for example, if we're talking about something like sentiment, maybe um, having some bad press about a company is, is – we might think that's going to be bad for a company and having some good press might be good for a company. Maybe having too much good press is bad for a company. I mean, I don't know. That's just an yeah. example. But yeah. the idea is if it's not a, a simple linear relationship and it's a little more complicated than that, something like a neural network is great for trying to learn that underlying uh, noise and relationships. Yeah. Mm. And what about overfitting, though? Do you think that there is uh, less of a chance of overfitting if you're using a neural network as an overlay rather than um, trying to get a, a model that looks at entry and exit as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, neural networks will overfit. That's exactly what their goal is to try and do. They're going to, they're going to, if left to themselves and without a lot of effort, they're going to overfit. What you're trying to do, I suppose, is you're trying to learn a generalizing, generalizable character of something without learning its specific character. And, um, and that's tricky to do in any technique. Uh, in neural networks, it, it, it's uh, based around trying to determine the architecture in terms of the number of nodes, hidden nodes and weightings and things like that that are being used. Um, I think the idea, though, is that um, if you just get some data and use a neural network and start trading with it, you, you, you probably miss, miss the plot. What you really want to do is uh, come up with a set of rules that you say, uh, from my experience and backtesting, I've come up with these rules and these are the ones I'm prepared to trade. Then you add the neural network to those rules um, so that the worst case is you're getting the same trades that you would have got before. Best case is the neural network's adding some value and you may get a subset of the trades you were prepared to take and hopefully they're the better ones. So I think that's how you try and avoid the overfitting part. Um, you don't let the neural network do its own thing. You provide it you know, carefully trained examples, if you like, that you would be prepared to actually trade anyway. So you're looking for it to kind of add some incremental improvement to what you do rather than actually present you with a whole different set of alternatives about what you could do. Mm, yeah. So in your research, have you found that it's quite easy to improve a strategy with neural networks or is that something that happens occasionally or how, how often does, do you find improvements using that type of approach? And normally you can uh, – neural networks are very good. I mean normally you can expect that you can be able to find some form of improvement. I suppose that the understanding is that uh, the inputs that go into the neural network you believe are somehow correlated with the problem that you're trying to solve. For example, somehow those inputs like sentiment in our example before are related to the fact that um, good sentiment leads to better returns and bad sentiment leads to, to worse returns. And you want the neural network to try and figure out how to present that relationship so you can make a bit more money. But I suppose the starting point is that if those variables like sentiment aren't related to your outcome – then you'll end up with a neural network that you that will uh, that that effectively will just add you know noise. So effectively, a neural network giving some inputs will train towards the output. But whether that's actually usable and useful to you or not really depends on whether those inputs are somehow related to what you're trying to achieve. And to some extent, you know that's a bit of a belief system. It might be sensible to assume that sentiment is is somehow related to next day's returns. There would be another group of people in finance who would argue that that. Um, you know, the information's already known in the market, and by the time people are Twittering and talking about it or the newspaper's writing articles about it, it probably happened several days ago and it's already been taken into account. So there would be a, another whole group of people who might make the argument that sentiment is completely useless. Um, and, and again, you know, that's it's back to back testing and doing it properly and, and um, you know, trying to get as informed as possible as you can and then coming up with some statistical methodology to determine whether or not you're going to move to sentiment or you're not going to move to sentiment. Okay, cool. So uh, for people who wanted to learn more about neural networks or get started, uh, do you have any recommendations for them? Um, I think there's a lot of good books out there. It's Like I say, it's not an area I've been spending a lot of time in lately, particularly neural networks. Um, I spend a lot more time in machine learning in general, um, uh, particularly statistical learning, uh, and there's a lot of good books out in that area. Um, there aren't so many good books that, that put it in a trading perspective. So, for example, if any of your listeners were to jump onto Google and type in words like big data or data science or statistical learning, you'll, you'll get an innumerable number of hits. 
Um, and I'm sure many of them are very, very good, but rarely will they actually put themselves within a trading context about how to use those techniques to improve trading. There just isn't a lot of work in that particular area. And that's what my first book was really to address. It wasn't designed for the trader or investor. It was designed for the student in my classroom. So it's a bit of a hard going, and I wouldn't necessarily say that people will get a lot out of just going to read that book. It contains a lot of academic references and examples rather than uh, pieces of code that do anything. So it was more to supplement um, the teaching area in the first place. But I think just making a start and trying to learn some around data science and big data would be a great idea for many traders. There are a huge number of those online courses, Coursera's and things like that, uh, where you can learn that kind of stuff, again, usually for free uh, and with a little bit of time investment of your own. And then the idea is to sit back and think about how you would apply that to your own trading. And there's not a lot of work specifically in that area. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So one more final question before we uh, start wrapping up with quick closing questions. Now, I understand you'll be speaking at the ATAA conference this year, which I'm um, looking forward to attending. So can you give us a brief uh, description of what you'll be uh, discussing at the conference? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And actually, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you personally as well, because I know you're presenting there too. Um, I'll be talking a lot about momentum investment specifically, um, my talk is really about trying to break momentum investment down into the academic evidence that supports it, the two different forms of cross-sectional versus time series momentum, and then how to start thinking about how to harvest from that anomaly. So, for example, and um, and I haven't started writing my presentation yet, so, <laughs> so I can't give you too much detail, um, but momentum is a monthly kind of uh, – a longer-term anomaly often done in monthly, but the idea is it's supposed to – uh, help you determine which group of stocks are most likely to go up and which are likely to go down over the coming months. And armed with that kind of information, um, the idea would be uh, if you weren't uh, looking at trading momentum in the monthly time frame, there still would be plenty of point to knowing that information. So, for example, knowing which stocks you thought were going to have the best return over the coming month or months would lead you to say, well, okay, maybe I should just look at trading amongst those or I'd look for drawbacks or pullbacks amongst those stocks and try and buy into them cheaply and those kind of things. So I think momentum can be an entry point into many, many other techniques, some shorter term, some longer term. Um, so it doesn't have to be just following the momentum anomaly. It's understanding enough about it so that you can engage with it in whatever time frame and constraints that you have as an individual. Hmm. That sounds great. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing that presentation, actually, Bruce. So um, I'll have a link for that up on the show notes page for people who want to find out more detail about the conference, and hopefully they can come and join us. It looks like it's going to be a great conference. It's got a lot of great speakers there, so that's going to be awesome. All right, I'd like to start wrapping up now with some quick closing questions. Yep. Are you ready? Okay, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Great question. Look, I think um, for me, it's two things. One is when I first started getting interested in investment and I started doing a bit of searching around, I realized that we actually do know a lot about markets. Uh, maybe not as individuals, but as an academic cohort, there are a lot of academics. There's an entire army of academics out there researching in investment strategies that work. And so I think just getting a piece of software and messing around with it without going and doing the, you know, the background reading that's required, you know, it's puts you at, a, at an extreme disadvantage. So go and have a look at what other people are doing. Go to Google Scholar. So many people go to google.com, go to scholar.google.com, and then you'll be searching amongst academic articles and search for things like momentum or, or whatever your favorite uh, terminology is, and you might find there's a huge amount of work there already done on it and a lot of lessons already learned. So that's one thing is that uh, look for things that are academically credible and don't go chasing pipe dreams. Um, the second thing I learned was about discipline. And it took me a lot to learn not to react to the market's short-term fluctuations because like every waking up one day and seeing I've lost a little bit of money, but um, but to think in the longer term. If I'm trading a longer term anomaly like momentum, why am I looking at it every day and worrying? I shouldn't be. So don't react to market short-term fluctuations. Rely on your own backtesting. And of course, that's why it's so important to do that backtesting properly. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks for that tip on scholar.google.com. I'd never heard of that before. So, um, oh, scholar.google.com is exactly like Google, but it searches among academically published articles. Oh, okay. And, and mostly right, you cool. can just download them and start reading them, same as everything else. So try it on Momentum next time, and you just get a huge number of articles. 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. SSRN is another good resource for that as well. I think so. Yeah. Um, SSRN is great. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that a lot of the work up there isn't necessarily being published. So often people put up documents on SSRN that are their working papers or their ideas. But if you go to scholar.google.com, they're actually academically published, which means they've been peer reviewed and other academics have come to the same conclusion from the same results. So it just gives that little bit of an extra hurdle of credibility. And I think really. If you think about trading and investing, it's all about trying to assure yourself on those dark days when the market seems to be against you that what you're doing actually makes sense. And so having that understanding that there's some real academic credibility has a lot of value. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. What do you think is one of the most important ingredients to becoming a successful trader? Um, great question. I think um, take a course in trading. Uh, like we talked about before about books, there's a lot of good books out there, but there's a lot of bad books too. You know, we can't be getting 90% failure rates amongst our uh, amongst traders. If that's the real number, we can't be getting that number if all the books out there have good stuff in them. Take take a course with somebody you actually trust uh, or somebody who's doing real uh, – presenting their work in public, somebody who's, who's being peer-reviewed, somebody whose results are available to go and see um, rather than just read about something in a book. I think um, for most people, um, starting to uh, learn a little bit about maths and stats would be valuable. Um, and to spend that time that we talked about before about starting off with only ideas that are academically credible. It doesn't mean academics have found everything, but they've been at it for a very long time and, and a lot of them. Um, so really just ignoring that the work that's already been done is, again, to the individual trader or investor's detriment. Yep, cool. All right, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, probably the easiest way is via, via uh, vanstonetrading.com. There's a feedback uh, link on there. Happy for um for people to put messages or or questions up on there for me. Um, I think if, if I could just add one extra thing um, about a bit of trading advice. One thing that I got told a long time ago, which I think I ignored a lot initially, but ten, um, tended to sort of come back to bite me, is that um, not to believe that you've got control over something that you just don't have control over. We have no control as investors and traders over the markets. So the idea is to think about something that's academically credible. What are the constraints you personally have to live with? So there's no point in developing a high-frequency trading system if you can't sit in front of the computer. There's no point in trading monthly if you're the sort of person who has to do something every five minutes. So take your constraints into account. Do some proper searching. Try and find out if there are other people working with those similar sorts of constraints and start your, start your journey there. Yeah, that's a good bit of advice. I um years ago I used to have a weekly um, momentum strategy which I traded for a while, but it it really annoyed me. I couldn't uh, wait to the end of the week to put on a trade, so <laughs> I stopped trading that because it didn't suit me. And uh, now I trade smaller time frames, and that's uh, that's really uh, what helps me. So I think yeah, that's a really good bit of advice there. Thanks, Andrew. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, Bruce. It's been really great chatting to you. Is there anything else that you'd um, like to mention before we finish up? Um, I guess if I could just leave one, uh, the listeners with one thought, um, it would be focus on something that's academically credible, backtest properly, and be patient, and you should get where you want to get to with trading and investment. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, uh, Bruce, for spending time with us today. Uh, it really was great chatting to you. I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you in person at the ATA conference in a couple of months. So uh, thanks again, and I wish you all the best. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for giving me some time on your uh, podcast. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Bruce. Bye. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.